Hello everyone, I'm Eric Swinson and I am honored to bring a message to you from the Institute of Lutheran Theology. I will be uh, giving a message based on Acts 9, the first reading for uh, Easter 3. Uh, let's pray. Father, you've asked your son to ask his disciples to feed the sheep. May our words be pleasing to you. May the sheep get everything they need so that they may thrive in their pasture. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to talk about Paul and his conversion. We're going to talk about conversions a little bit. Paul received from the high priest in Jerusalem the authority to extradite Christian Jews living in Damascus. And he probably did that voluntarily. That is, it was his idea. And that's based on, uh, we have three testimonies by Paul of what happened on the road to Damascus. In his own words from later in the book of Acts, chapter 26, Paul says, Indeed, I thought myself, I must do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I did this in Jerusalem. I shut them up in prison. I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. You know, this story of the conversion of St. Paul, on the one hand, is a vivid scene. We might think of it as an example of a split-second conversion. One moment he was going down the road breathing murderous thoughts, then there was a blinding light, a voice as from heaven, and then he was speaking with Jesus, and his plans had changed forever. However, if we look at it, carefully. This is the type of conversion it was. Saul had to wait a few, several days before Ananias came and prayed for him. Only then did he receive his sight, receive the Holy Spirit, and then, as it says, he called on the name of the Lord. Now, testimony to all this occurs in Acts 22, where Paul says that he then returned to Jerusalem and, well, no, when Paul returned to Jerusalem much later, in 20, in, it, that's where he gives his testimony in Acts 22. He was taken by soldiers and he testifies to this Jewish mob. The, in other words, the soldiers really kind of took Paul uh, under their protection. He testifies to the mob that after all this, he returned to the temple and he was praying. And in a trance, Jesus appeared to him and told him to flee Jerusalem. And then we know that the other stories from him that, that he, he actually had to go away for a while and, uh, and only later did he start his, his preaching mission for which, you know, we of course, he is, he is famous and we are grateful. In other words, this conversion, the road to Damascus conversion, was a process. And we need to understand this. Uh, we need to understand that this this Saul remains Saul until Acts 13. And here it is, we're talking about Acts 9 today. So let's talk about conversions for a second. Everyone needs to be converted. We need to, as Ananias, that early Christian who was called upon to love his enemy and to go to Saul and lay hands on him. Now imagine laying hands in prayer on someone whom you know wants to lay hands on you in order to put you in chains and drag you away. Ananias needed a conversion that day, didn't he? He had to understand in concrete terms what Jesus meant about loving one's enemy. More had to happen before Saul became Paul. And there is more to happen to you before you become the person Jesus needs you to be for his work in the Father's fields. He said, 
I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you to open their eyes, in order to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not so surrounded in my life by the saints. You know, by those people who look like they are in light and not darkness. I am not surrounded by people who seem to revel in their forgiveness of sins. In other words, the mission that Jesus gave to Paul, that I just read to you, that his message, message to the Gentiles, this, is, this message, this mission, <laughs> is just as much alive today as it was back then. It's just as urgent today as it was back then. Now I'm going to change the subject just a little bit. What I've said so far is that we all need conversions. That I think that there are multiple conversions. We, have, we begin with a conversion to know that we are sinners and we need to repent from our sins. But that the good news is that Jesus died for our sins. But along the line, as we grow into understanding, to, to, to know what is, what is needed and, 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 and where the joy of the Christian life exists, we need more conversions. We, we, our heart has to be changed. And, and, and this beyond all the, the work that the world does on our heart to, to harden our hearts and stiffen our necks. So, I have another question though for you. The same way that when Jesus was giving his mission to Saul and this message about why are you persecuting me, is it not a good message to each of us? In thinking about giving this message, what was impressed upon me was this. I had to ask myself, who am I persecuting? Common to the three descriptions of, in Acts, why did Paul say this three times? Why did the Holy Spirit direct Luke to write this down? Three times. Why are you persecuting me? Paul, in response to Jesus saying, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? And the reply is, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I had to ask myself, Who are you, Lord? Do I really understand? Who am I persecuting? And when we ask this question, Why do you persecute Jesus? That's a, isn't that a question to all of us? And if we ask this, because, I mean, maybe, you know, you got it all figured out. And you're positive that you never do anything that Jesus might think called persecution of him. But actually, I think we are all, to some degree or another, guilty of this. How do we persecute Jesus? I think many ways. Perhaps it is best to think of the things that we do as we represent him. I spend a lot of time online, and, and most of it in sort of an official way. That is, I am a pastor that helps an online school of theology, and, and I am someone who has concerns about the state of the evangelical Lutheran church. So I look at things from that perspective. And, and, and I also, I mean, I see myself as a Lutheran Christian, and predominantly as a Christian, and, and that all the Christians are, are my brothers and sisters, and, and, and they are my friends, and I know many from many different backgrounds, and I look in, I look around, and I, and I see us as part of that. And, this, and so, and I look at them, and I understand them as my brothers and my sisters. And I'll tell you what I see from my perspective. I see a very fragmented church. 
Now, some pastors and other folk are at war with other points of view. I can't help but wonder if they identify with Saul or with Paul. On the other hand, I see a lot of sheer nonsense being peddled in the name of religion. However, I think both of those groups are pretty small. I think most church people are in the middle. A big, soft middle. And who knows what is going on there? It might be a big, non-Bible reading middle. The American Bible Society just released a poll. 25% report they read the Bible regularly four times a week. Not bad. But do remember this is a self-reporting survey. 52% report they read the Bible regularly four times a year. Yes, you heard that right. Imagine saying, yes, I'm a Christian. What's the next question? Do I read the Bible? Yes, I read it regularly. Four times a year. We have given people the idea that by being members of our churches, some of which are little more than combinations of child care and social club and civic, civic organization, that they are making our Lord happy. Do you know that Christians are being actively persecuted in 130 different countries? Do we not think that that is Jesus being persecuted? And what are we doing about it? Mostly ignoring it. What shall we do? Well, I think we need to talk to Jesus about it. I'm not saying this about the persecuted church to administer a little guilt and urge you to run off to one of those 130 countries and put an end to it. Or even to refer you to these wonderful organizations like Voice of the Martyr, Martyrs and Persecution.com. And, and the International Christian Concerns. There are many good groups. No, what I'm saying simply is we need to change. We need to devote some time to prayer and then do something based on our prayer. Is there a connection between a soft church that does not read the Bible and a culture that permits this persecution in other countries? For me, this is an issue like so many other issues. It is just so wrong. It is so obvious. And, and we just do nothing. And that includes repenting of our part in these great evils today. To close, on this coming Sunday, I imagine most preachers who use the lectionary are going to preach the gospel lesson, which is resurrected Jesus meeting with his disciples on the seashore of Lake Gennesaret. He asked them, feed my sheep. Perhaps we are persecuting Jesus simply by not doing what he said. We spend a lot of time arguing about theology and we do need to tend to that, but we also have to keep this intention with feeding the sheep. And I think to do that, we need to keep converting. We ourselves need to turn to God and asking Jesus daily, how is my conversion going? I'm not persecuting you too much, am I? In what ways? What do, how do I need to change? And then wait for the response. Amen. That's my message. And now, if you would, join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your many blessings. Chiefly the blessing of Jesus, your gift to the world. Born in Bethlehem crucified in Jerusalem, resurrected and ascended to your right hand. For we are so glad that he is interceding for us. Intercede for us, Jesus, and for your church here. 
help us to get serious, to be real and relevant. Help us to engage people and, and not just be about churchianity. Lord, I ask you to bless everybody listening, everybody praying now. I ask you to bless the Institute of Lutheran Theology and bless your Evangelical Lutheran Church worldwide and all your churches everywhere, Lord. Give them faithful preachers and pastors and deacons and, and people who are willing to joyfully serve you. Bless all your missionaries and evangelists that they go forth, that they keep things simple and real. Show the benefits that you offer in your Son. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.